Well, hello, everybody. This week, we're going to study the Book of Mormon. We're going to do some historical context and a little bit of content from Alma 39 through Alma 42. That's this week's Come Follow Me reading. A little background to this. Here's some uh, great things that will help us understand this section of reading a little bit better. Remember, Alma, this is Alma the Younger, is talking to his sons. Uh, the previous week, we learned what he said to Helaman, his oldest son, and Shiblon, the middle son. But this week's reading, these chapters are all to the youngest son, Corianton. If you recall, Corianton attended his uh, a mission with his father, his brother Shiblon, remember Helaman stayed home, and his uncles, uh, the sons of Mosiah, uh, or the sons of Mosiah. So what we have here is this large group going on a mission to the Zoramites. And we saw that they were in a, an apostate form, but the Lord, in his tender mercy, pulled the righteous out of that people and had them join the Nephites. So let's take a look at what uh, Alma is going to say to his son. Now again, some context behind this. If you recall, Alma had his own problems in his younger days. He rejected and willfully rebelled against his father, Alma the Elder. And he had left his ministry and was doing all kinds of horrible things when an angel came and corrected him. In this case, Alma is not calling on an angel. Alma himself is going to go deliver this message. So let's go to Alma 39 and see what he's going to say and how he's going to deliver this message. So in verse 1 and 2, you'll notice that he, Alma is comparing two of his sons. Now, I know sometimes that's very dangerous, but in this case, Alma's going to do that. And we know he's comparing him to Shiblon, not Helaman, because he says that he was diligent in, uh, on the mission to the Zoramites. That's verse 2. Well, Helaman didn't go, so we know he's talking about Shiblon, which makes it interesting that in the last chapter, that that line Alma said to Shiblon, uh, when he said, let's go there, it's Alma 38, verse 12, when he says, bridle all your passions. But here in 39, we see that Corianton did not do that. So let's go to verse 3. We know that while they were on their mission do, trying to reclaim the uh, Zoramites and those that had left the church and who are doing uh, apostate forms of worship and prayer, that uh, he leaves. Uh, Corantin leaves, and in verse 3, it says he goes to the land of Siren, and he meets the woman, the harlot Isabel. Now, the Book of Mormon talks a lot about a lot of wonderful women, but it only mentions six women by name, and Isabel's one of them. And we know a couple of them that were just Old Testament names, such as uh, Sarah and Eve and Mary. So half of the women in the Book of Mormon mentioned by name are, are uh, Bible names. And then here's Isabel. The other two, by the way, are Sariah, Lehi's, again, the, the mother of the of the, the covenant here in America, like Adam and Eve. We know Eve's name very, and know quite a bit about her. In this case, Lehi and Sariah. Then the only other woman is Abish, which we learned about recently, uh, that Lamanitish woman who is a convert to the church. Anyway, so Isabel, not a good woman. And verse four gives us a little background about why she's not. She is stealing the hearts away of many, but uh, Corianton should have known better. So, Let's go to verse 5 for a moment. And Alma's explaining why the violation of the law of chastity is such a strong commitment. In fact, it says in verse 5, most abominable above all sins. And then he gives two exceptions. One of the exceptions is denying the Holy Ghost. So we're going to put that one aside for a moment. We're going to talk about the, this one and the other one, uh, shedding of innocent blood. So when Moses received the commandments, the first four commandments are all about God. The fifth commandment is about our parents. But commandments six through ten are all about other people. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. The seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. I want you to think why those are first. 
when we're dealing with other people, they're the first two commandments. God treats not lightly the entering of life and the ending of life. He wants to control that. So he puts commandments to safeguard both the entry and exit of life. And they're the most serious of all the commandments of God. How we bring life into the world and how life leaves the world. It's to be in God's hands. And he's guarded it very, very closely with the two strongest commandments that deal with other people. So uh, that's a great conversation you can have with your family. In fact, verse 7, he even calls it a crime. Remember, until recently, uh, adultery and murder have been two of the strongest crimes in the laws of our civilization. Why? Because it deals with entering and exiting of life. That, that is not our job to control. Uh, but we live in a world today where uh, the seventh commandment is not even considered a crime anymore. Uh, adultery is considered a form of, or fornication, a form of entertainment and recreation. Uh, and murder, I mean, with abortion, we, we, there's not even, not even uh, there's no longer not a punishment, but it's almost considered a, uh, a superhero. Oh, you're so brave. You, you did these things. And we see that the value of life is just not what it used to be in the eyes of man anyway. Well, verse 10, I thought was really interesting. He tells it, his son, go talk with your older brothers, counsel with them, work with them. Again, sometimes as parents, maybe we should allow our children to work some of their challenges and problems out together. There might be a power in that. I thought that was a great principle in there. Uh, verse 15, I want to touch on because that leads into what's about to happen. In verse 15, he talks about the coming of Christ. So his son has violated uh, the mission rules, the, the law of chastity, uh, some major elements. I mean, these are illegal crimes. And now he's going to bring in the Savior. So I think when we talk about uh, discipline and punishment and crimes and sins, we need to have the Savior in the center of that conversation because it's through Christ that all things will be made whole. So let's go to chapter 40 then. Chapter 40, verse 1. Why is Corianton concerned with the resurrection? Well, knowing what just happened in the previous chapter, this makes sense. He's guilty of crimes and commandment breaking and the law of chastity and leaving a mission. And now he knows that the Savior's involved and he's going to come. So he's concerned about this and his father notices that. So let's go to verse 9. Alma 40 verse 9. Therefore, there is a time appointed unto man that they should rise from the dead. There is a space between the time of death and the resurrection. So we're really not going to talk about the resurrection right now, and we're not talking about death, but that time period in between, it's not an instantaneous thing. And Alma's making that very clear, that you're not going to die and resurrect instantaneously. There's going to be a, a time you have to wait. And his wait was at least until the uh, birth, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ remember, there's been no resurrection up to this point. This is before the Savior. In our day, we're told that we are not going to resurrect immediately after death. That there will, The resurrection will come at a, a specific point in time. In fact, since the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and all between Adam and Jesus Christ were resurrected, which would be all of the righteous prophets and apostles and wonderful men and women who lived a celestial life, that the resurrection is on hold right now. In other words... There's no reason to believe Joseph Smith has been resurrected yet. There will be a time when that will take place. There are three exceptions that we know of. Uh, Peter and James came to Joseph Smith as resurrected beings. John hasn't died yet, so there was no resurrection there. And Joseph Smith said that Moroni was a resurrected being. So we know that to perform certain missions where you need a physical body to lay in on of hands, deliver plates and so forth, a resurrected body is needed. Moving on. So let's take a look at this 
space uh, between death and resurrection. That's really the doctrine that he's teaching right here. Verse 12, I want you to look for uh, what, when, where, who, why, all of those key things in here. Verse 12. What is verse 12? It specifically says it's paradise. So this would be a, a good activity to do. Get a, a whiteboard or a, or a paper and draw a line across it and then put a T right down the middle. And on one side, I put it on the right side, write paradise because I like to choose the right. Who's there? Well, according to verse 12, it's righteous people. So just write righteous. Why are they there? It's because they chose righteousness. What is their life like? It's, well, it mentions happiness rest, peace, all their troubles and sorrows and cares, gone. That sounds like a pretty good place. Now go to verse 13 and 14. They kind of go together. Again, who, what, where, when, why? What's the place called? Well, look in there. In verse 13, it calls it outer darkness. Who's there? Well, it says wicked and evil. And why are they there? It's because they chose evil. They let the spirit of the devil in, right? Verse 14 says they're going to remain there. What are they doing? Well, it says there's weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. Again, this is not uh, sounding like a pleasant place. So a, a little story with this doctor. Uh, uh, for about a decade, I taught a, uh, religion classes at, at BYU, and I would have a class almost always full of returned missionaries who uh, were pretty confident they uh, knew the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and they did. They were great. But I would ask them, I said, do you have to be baptized to go to this spirit paradise? And we would read these verses. And they would really struggle with that seemingly simple question. Do you have to be baptized to be in spirit paradise? Are the people who are not baptized weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth? Are they wicked and they're evil? And they would go back and forth. No, they're not evil. There's some righteous people that just haven't been baptized. So are they in a state of rest and happiness? Or do they have to be baptized first? And we went back and forth. And so I would finally open up this little book. You guys remember this book? Gospel Principles. This was a book given to people who uh, were investigating the church or recent members that wanted to learn about some of the basic gospel principles. I says, the answer's in here. And they're like, you mean the answers to this difficult, deep doctrinal question is in the book that we give people who want to learn about the basics of the church? And I would say, yes. In chapter 41, it says, under spirit prison, the apostle Peter referred to the post-mortal spirit world as a prison, which it is for some. In the spirit prison are the souls of all though of those who have not yet received the gospel of Jesus Christ. These spirits have agency and may be enticed by both good and evil. If they accept the gospel and the ordinances performed for them in the temples, they may leave the spirit prison and dwell in paradise. Can you be in paradise and not be baptized? The answer is, no. Wait a minute. But I look at verse 13. There's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and they're wicked and they're evil. They let the spirit of the devil in. You and I all know people who have died who never uh, were baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They're righteous, good people. They don't fit in that category. But I want you to notice something. What did this book and what did the Apostle Peter refer the post-mortal spirit world as? Prison. What does Alma call it? Outer darkness. There's a difference. Prison would be anybody who has not accepted the ordinance, including righteous people who haven't accepted or haven't been baptized. And it would include everyone who's Alma is talking about this outer darkness. So the realm of spirit prison is much larger than just evil people or unbaptized people. It's all of them. So why doesn't Alma talk about it? 
Why does he not mention it? Here's a thought. The Book of Mormon has been judged as a heaven or hell kind of a book, meaning it's you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. There's no middle ground. Here's a, here's a reason for that. Once you've read the book, there is no middle ground. You already have been taught one way or the other. Well, usually we're talking about those who haven't had an opportunity to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, historical context. Alma's talking to his son, who is a missionary, who's preaching the word of God. That middle ground that we keep referring to that's missing in here isn't an option for Coriantum because he already knows he will either be accepted into righteousness or wickedness. Middle ground is gone. Once you have learned the gospel, you've left that uh, middle ground that we keep worrying about all of our ancestors about. That's one reason why the Book of Mormon is one way or the other. Once you've read it, you've left neutrality forever. So besides, where is the spirit world? Uh, in that same chapter in the Gospel Principles book, Latter-day prophets have said that the spirits of those who have died, we're talking those in spirit paradise, prison, outer darkness, before the resurrection, they are not far from us. President Ezra Taft Benson said, quote, Sometimes the veil between this life and the life beyond becomes very thin. Our loved ones who have passed on are not far from us. President Brigham Young taught that the post-mortal spirit world is on the earth around us. So there's a couple things we can, we can gather from this. Again, Alma's teaching his son very specifically that you have a choice. You're either going to accept it or reject it. There's no, I didn't know because he does know. And two, we sometimes draw divisions and lines like they're geographical, meaning some guy's in prison and he's locked behind bars and he can't get out. Well, here in this life, I think is a prototype of the next life. Are there righteous and wicked gathered or separated in this life? Well, we do the gathering and separation ourselves. We don't need some police to come and separate us in most cases, right? It's real easy to figure out where are they at Sunday morning? The righteous seem to gather and study scriptures and participate in ordinances and renew covenants and focus on the Savior. Whereas um, the wicked don't. Maybe they're doing something else. Again, maybe there's that group that they just don't know which is a complete and uh, realistic possibility. They don't know where to go or to gather. So I don't think it's like in a place where there's prison and bars in the spirit world and we're trying to get out. I think there's people in this life that realize, hey, you know what? There's the covenants and happiness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and I'm not there. And so they do everything they can to get baptized. And once they are baptized, again, there's no physical geographical location change. They just then have this sense of peace joy, rest, and happiness. Also, here's another quote that I really, really love. Uh, this was, and, and this is in the Institute Manual. Melvin J. Ballard, he's an apostle, uh, said this, it, it is my judgment that any man or woman can do more to conform to the laws of God in one year in this life than they could in 10 years when they are dead. The spirit can only repent and change, and then battle has to go on forward with the flesh. Interesting concept there. So when we get to Alma, uh, you know, 34, which we did, and it says this is the time and the life to prepare to repent, uh, I, I think we can repent more readily, more quickly, more effectively while we have the body, the physical body with us. There's a quote Take it for what you enjoy, for what you want. Let's move on. The rest of this chapter does deal with the resurrection and restoration, as does chapter 41. So if you want to look at chapter 41 for a moment, there are several verses in there about restoration and what it means to be restored. If you had small children, you want to help them understand this principle, go find an old couch or a car 
maybe an old home and talk about a restoration. What does it mean to restore it? It would actually be a good project. I know time consuming here to restore something. Take an old couch. We have an old couch. It's a wonderful couch, great frame and everything, but it's old. To restore it, we would have to rip all of the fabric, all of the foam, clean it out, repair any broken parts, put new foam and fabric on it. And it could be a beautiful couch. No, it's still going to be a couch. You can't restore a couch to be a, a car, but it's going to be restored back to its proper original state. That is what the resurrection does. It takes me. I'm going to be resurrected and restored back to the perfect, complete soul that uh, I have. But again, if I'm evil, I'm not going to be restored to righteous. And Alma gives that great discourse to his son. Let's go to chapter 42. Chapter 42, verse 1. Now, he's going to talk about punishment and justice. Uh, I'll just read verse 1. And now, my son, I perceive there is somewhat more which doth worry your mind, which ye cannot understand, which is concerning the justice of God and in, in the punishment of the sinner. For ye do try to suppose that it is injustice that the sinner should be consigned to a state of misery. In other words, you're like, it's not just if I am a sinner and I get consigned to a state of misery. So he's going to give this wonderful discourse about Adam and Eve partaking of the fruit and what real justice is and the mercy of get, being allowed time to repent. Again, studying with uh, Second Nephi chapter 2 and a few other places, this is a great time to review the plan of happiness, which mentions that in verse 8. That's what it's called in verse 8. So I think what's going on here is Alma is looking at his son Corianton and says, you think that happiness is coming from sin, but that's not where we get it. Remember Alma 41.10, wickedness never was happiness. Satan is really good at getting us to look, of, of not being happy. He's trying to make us miserable like unto himself. And he does that in two ways. One, he takes righteous people and he tries to get them to say, you can't be happy. If you're experiencing joy, pleasure, happiness, punish yourself. You do something to circumvent that happiness. And we, I think there's a lot of righteous people that do that. They just can't have fun. They will not allow themselves to be righteous. On the other extreme, he gets people to say, go do whatever you want. The only way you're going to have fun is to sin. And that sinning will make you happy but he obviously uses different language. Go ahead, break the commandments. The law of chastity is old fashioned. Uh, you go have fun. That will bring happiness to you. Both extremes are promoting this, uh, the adversary's plan, which is to make men miserable. Where the Savior clearly has taught that, you no, know, keeping the commandments that I'm giving you, that will make you happy. Uh, not killing will bring peace and happiness in your life. Not committing the law of chastity, but having a wonderful relationship with your spouse, that will bring happiness and joy. Uh, relationship with parents and with others, not stealing. The basic commandments bring joy, peace, rest, and happiness. So let's go to verse 15. This is Alma 42, verse 15. And now the plan of mercy could not be brought about except an atonement should be made. You'll notice the Savior, or uh, Alma is bringing the Savior into this conversation to help heal his son. Therefore, God himself atoneth for the sins of the world to bring about the plan of mercy, to appease the demands of justice, that God might be a perfect, just God and a merciful God also. Again, here is a loving father who knows because of his past, that wickedness is not happiness. Keeping the commandments and repentance will bring the peace, love, and mercy of the Savior Jesus Christ to us. In verse 27 has a, a powerful verse. Uh, Wherefore, O my son, whosoever will come may come and partake of the waters of life freely. Have you ever been thirsty? I mean, I'm talking on one of those hot humid days when you're just sweating and you're just dehydrated and you need, boy, you have that garden hose with cool, refreshing water. Alma says that water is 
free and the savior wants you to drink of it so you're satisfied and filled and i love that imagery verse 29 and now my son i desire that ye should let these things trouble you no more that is the power of the atonement you truly can repent you can partake of the waters of jesus christ freely they'll heal you you can find true peace and happiness in this life and then verse 31 he says i want you to go out and preach this to others i think those of us whether we have a formal mission call or we're just uh, repentant sinners we have that privilege to go out and share that message that gospel with others and i hope you do so uh, next week, we will look at Alma chapters 43 through 52. Again, now we know that the apostate Zoramites have joined with the Lamanites. This is the beginning of the battle. We'll see you next week.